They say we now control weather, that we're responsible for extreme heat events, dirty weather, climate disasters. Climate is the average weather over a period of decades. So it's only natural to connect man-made climate change with changes in weather and say extreme weather events are now caused by man. Makes sense, doesn't it? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, they've been warning us for decades. We didn't listen. Now James Hansen of the Goddard Institute of Space Studies, GISS, is on the news talking about those extreme heat events. So explain the, how we know that these events are happening and that they're not part of any sort of natural cycle. They are, uh, in fact, a product of global warming, and we can see that very easily. Al Gore has given it a new name, Dirty Weather. This year we're creating something we call the Dirty Weather Report, because the weather we're experiencing now is just that, dirty. It's fueled by dirty fossil fuel energy and misinformation. Kevin Trenberth from the National Center for Atmospheric Research explains all about climate disasters on the news too. And so these areas where the really hot and dry conditions leading to wildfires have, has moving around, it, it, we certainly don't expect them to occur every year, but we do expect more of them. The odds are changing uh, for these to occur with uh, climate change, with the global warming from the human influences on climate. Birth and associate Dr. John Fasulo has recently published a meticulous paper in a scientific peer-reviewed journal about the extreme weather events of 2010. The title of the paper, Climate Extremes and Climate Change, the Russian Heat Wave and Other Climate Extremes of 2010. This paper is a return to old-time climate studies. They didn't use climate models due to failings in the models, but that's just as well. There are brilliant diagnostic efforts within the paper to explain the cause of the Russian heat wave and other weather events that year, and they were all caused by sea surface temperatures. Trenberth and Fasulo looked at the sea surface temperatures of four regions and explained the flooding, the monsoons, the Russian heat wave from those high sea surface temperatures. To sum up the paper in one sentence, the 2009-2010 El Nino and the beginning of the 2010-2011 La Nina were ultimately responsible for the record rainfalls, the Russian heat wave, and the other meteorological weather extremes of 2010. Don't get concerned now. They refer to man-made global warming. It's noted a couple times in the paper. In the discussion at the end, Trenberth and Fasulo write, However, there is a, also a significant global warming component, and they refer to Gillette et al. 2008. That's a climate model study. The human influence is systematic and persistent, and can be thought of as an underlying warming of about six-tenths of a degree Celsius since the 1950s. For those not familiar with Celsius, that's more than one degree Fahrenheit. As opposed to looking at those four little regions individually, let's look at the big picture the Indian and Pacific Oceans, with Arctic and Southern Oceans thrown in for good measure. With these longitudes, this area captures those four little regions. The climate models used by the IPCC for their fourth assessment report are stored in an archive called the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project Phase 3, or CMIP-3. There are dozens of models, and many of the modeling groups ran multiple simulations. What's presented in the graph is the average of all of the model simulations of sea surface temperatures for this region that are contained in the CMIP-3 archive. The time period is the last 20 years. The multi-model mean is basically the best guess estimate from the IPCC's climate models of how sea surface temperatures warmed in response to man-made greenhouse gases. As you can see, I've also added a linear trend line Spreadsheet software like Excel can determine that for you. They even throw in the line on the graph. According to the models, the sea surface temperature of the Indian and Pacific Ocean Plus data set warmed over three-tenths of a degree Celsius over the last 20 years, and that's more than half a degree Fahrenheit. That's a lot of warming over 20 years from greenhouse gases. No wonder the climate scientists are all concerned. But there's a problem. 
reality is different than the models. The sea surface temperatures for that Indian and Pacific Ocean Plus data set haven't warmed in 20 years. It's not that they haven't warmed as much as the models say. They haven't warmed at all. Don't believe me? Go to the KNMI Climate Explorer and select the Hadley Center's Interpolated Sea Surface Temperature data set. Use the same coordinates I used and start in 1993. By the way, that Hadley Center's interpolated I, er, sea surface temperature data set is the same one used by Trenbert and Fasulo. Kind of odd that Trenbert and Fasulo overlook something like that. The Pacific and Indian Oceans, along with the corresponding portions of the Arctic and Southern Oceans, cover about 75% of the surface area of the global oceans. It's not a small region. No wonder they had to refer to climate models for proof of global warming. They couldn't use data. Oh, by the way, you can download the multi-model mean output at the KNMI Climate Explorer 2. Let's look at the Atlantic Ocean data. We know globally sea surface temperatures have warmed over the past 20 years. Since the Indian and Pacific data haven't warmed in that time, it has to have warmed someplace. Sea surface temperatures for the Atlantic plus portion have warmed, but the North Atlantic has another mode of natural variability called the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, and that's the reason it continues to warm while the Indian and Pacific data have not. Of course, the models still simulate too much warming from greenhouse gases by about 48%. Keep in mind the North Atlantic will eventually stop warming at that rate. It's nearly the time when the warming will, there will slow down and stop and eventually cool for a few decades. It's been cycling like that for thousands of years. Let's look at maps of the warming patterns of the modeled and observed sea surface temperatures for the past 20 years. The scale to the right is not temperature, it's correlation coefficient. A region that warmed linearly for the past 20 years would have a correlation coefficient of 1. The maps show areas that warmed in yellows, oranges, and red, and if there were portions of the oceans that cooled, they would be shown in greens and blues. The following four maps present how the sea surface temperatures correlate with time. Basically, the maps are showing trend patterns. If greenhouse gases warmed the Indian and Pacific Ocean Plus data set, they should have warmed in a spatial pattern like this, according to the models, and it shows a general warming. As Trenberth and Fasulo wrote, quote, The human influence is systematic and persistent and can be thought of as the underlying warming, end quote. But that's in the models, not the real world. Since greenhouse gases did not warm the Indian and Pacific Ocean Plus data set, the warming and cooling patterns look like this. Obviously, the cooling in the areas where the sea surface temperatures dropped, the green and blues, equaled the warming in the other areas. There are no similarities in the spatial patterns, none. The models incorrectly assume the oceans are warmed by greenhouse gases. They're not. There is nothing in the satellite era sea surface temperature records that indicate a man-made influence. The oceans in the real world are warmed and cooled via oceanic processes. Obviously those processes are not modeled well or they're turned off in the models for attribution studies. Now the Atlantic. If greenhouse gases warm the Atlantic Ocean Plus data set, they should have warmed in a spatial pattern like this, according to the models. Again, general warming. Since greenhouse gases did not warm the Atlantic Ocean Plus data set, these are the warming and cooling patterns that were experienced. There, the natural warming, primarily in the North Atlantic, exceeded the natural cooling. But again, there are no similarities between the modeled and the observed spatial patterns. So where does that leave us with Hansen, Gore, and Trenberth? Hansen's extreme heat events, Gore's dirty weather, and Trenberth's climate disasters are <laughs>
Mm. Now, what's that word I'm looking for? Misinformation. Thanks, Al. In other words, their alarm is baloney. Assuming the other analyses in that paper by Trenberth and Fasulo are correct, then extreme weather events on land are a function of El Nino and La Nina events and other natural weather phenomena. Or, if we look at that another way, land surface temperatures and weather are simply along for the ride, imitating and responding to natural variations in sea surface temperatures. Hansen, Gore, and Trenberth haven't proved the oceans have warmed in agreement with the greenhouse hypothesis. They can't. In summary, there's nothing new, and what we're seeing should be considered expected responses to a naturally warming world. The key component in the Trenberth and Fasulo paper were El Nino and La Nina. While Trenberth and Fasulo noted some of the reasons why they couldn't use climate models to study the causes of the 2010 weather events, they forgot to mention climate models simulate El Nino and La Nina very poorly too. Gilliardi et al. 2009, Understanding El Nino in Ocean Atmosphere General Circulation Models, Progress and Challenges, weren't so bashful. It's a 16-page study of how poorly climate models simulate El Nino and La Nina events. The models get little right. Here's the quote that's appropriate for this discussion. Gilliardi et al. write, Because ENSO is the dominant mode of climate variability at interannual timescales, the lack of consistency in the model predictions of the response of ENSO to global warming currently limits our confidence in using these predictions to address adaptive societal concerns, such as regional impacts or extremes. That's quite a statement by a group of well-respected climate scientists, don't you think? Speaking of El Nino and La Nina, I've just published a book called Who Turned On The Heat? The Unsuspected Global Warming Culprit, El Nino Southern Oscillation. I'm Bob Tisdale. I'm an independent researcher who studies the processes of El Nino and La Nina and their long-lasting after-effects. In the closing of the book, I noted, However, this book clearly illustrated and described the following. 1. Sea surface temperature and ocean heat content data for the past 30 years show the global oceans have warmed. There is no evidence, however, that the warming was caused by anthropogenic greenhouse gases in part or in whole. That is, the warming can be explained by natural ocean atmosphere processes, primarily ENSO. 2. The global oceans have not warmed as hindcast and projected by the climate models stored in the CMIP-3 and CMIP-5 archived, which were used and are being used by the IPCC for their fourth and upcoming fifth assessment reports. In other words, the climate models cannot simulate the warming rates or spatial patterns of the warming of the global oceans. And 3. Based on the preceding two points, the climate models in the CMIP-3 and CMIP-5 archives, which are used by the IPCC, show no skill. That is, the climate models provide little to no value as tools for projecting future climate change on global and regional levels. So what are climate models good for, you're probably asking yourself. That's a tough question, especially when we consider all of the things they can't do. But the climate models show that greenhouse gases do not warm the global oceans. This video is based on my blog post, a blog memo to Kevin Trenberth, NCAR. And my book is previewed in the post, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About El Nino and La Nina. Part two of this video will be based on that book and will explain the natural warming of global sea surface temperatures over the past 30 years. Have a good day.